from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell and the reason why I wasn't with you last week is that I was on an aeroplane and I'm now on Jim's time zone. I'm in Melbourne. A lovely place for you to play your guitar and it's <laughs> nice to see you in Australia. It's Jim Maxwell for the ABC. I'm in Sydney. Well, it's winter time here in India and I've picked myself a bit of a cold up in the Rajasthan desert. I beg your pardon. Uh, but I'm back in Bangalore, only just uh, for Akashwani. This is Charu Sharma. Now, on this week's Stumped, we will get to the public spat between former Aussie teammates. But we're going to start this week with one of the most dramatic finals in the history of the Women's Big Bash League in Australia. Now, there were more than 12,000 fans in at Adelaide Oval. Whether you think that's a big number for a final or not, uh, we can come to that. But it all came down to Brisbane Heat needing 13 runs from the final over to beat the defending champions, Adelaide Strikers. Heat fell just three runs short. Uh, they lost two wickets in that final over. It means Adelaide, the strikers, are now back-to-back -back champions. So, Jim, on last week's show, we talked about some of the stars of the strikers team. Uh, it was Amanda Jade Wellington who was the hero, taking those two wickets in that last over to seal victory. I mean, just how good was she and has she been this series, this tournament? Uh, she's a, a very, very good competitor and she held her nerve. Um, you know, she she backed her skill uh, to get those wickets because <laughs> the opportunity was there for her to be donged over the top and over the boundary. Um, but on two occasions, the catches went up in the air and they were held. So uh, as, as a wrist spinner, you know, there's always the chance that you'll, you'll go the journey. But uh, you also think, in her case, because of her experience, she got a pretty good chance against the lower order. And, um, well, she backed up that, that confidence, uh, that desire by bowling just the right deliveries uh, that resulted in those two crucial wickets. What a game, though. It really was a, a tremendous contest and uh, just the kind of final the WBBL needed after they, they pinched a, a big break over everyone else in terms of the presentation of cricket in Australia because the boys were off somewhere else winning a trophy in India. That's right. But they had centre stage on the Australian time zone, didn't they? All of that time. And they've, yep. yeah, that final was a really wonderful finale. Now, one player who was playing in her first ever WBBL final was the Zimbabwean leg spinner, uh, Anesu Mashangwe, who's become the first player from her country to win the Women's Big Bash League. And she joins us now on Stumped. Anesu, thanks so much for being with us. I mean, goodness, tell us first of all about the emotions of that final over in particular and just how it felt being on the field? I felt really calm and uh, confident that we we're going to make it. Because, um, I mean, we have defended less than that before. Uh, I remember in the Sydney Thunder game, it was almost the same scenario. That same belief that we're going to make it as well. So um, I felt like the energy around the group, they were calm as well in that moment. Mm. And of course, it's not your first season with the Strikers, but your first really sort of season where you've established yourself in 17 wickets across the competition. How much have you enjoyed it? And have you learned a lot by those who you're playing with during this season? Yes, I've learned a lot from um, Megan Shoot, uh, Talia, um, Amanda Jade Wellington, even Gemma Busby, uh, how to go about different situations and especially with Talia, uh, how to maintain a certain level of uh, calmness depending with, uh, with the situation. So yeah, it's been, it's been great. I feel like I've um, gained a lot being around them and it has helped my bowling as well. Yeah, and to talk about your bowling, you taught yourself leg spin, didn't you? H how did you manage that? Tell us about it. I was, I think, 18, 18, 19, because I used to be a medium pace bowler. So I wanted to make it into the Zimbabwean team. And I didn't see myself making it with my pace bowling and it, being a better as well. I didn't, myself, I didn't see myself making it that way. And then I just yeah opted to try spin. And then I went the faster way, like using my fingers more without using my wrist. And then from there, I started being picked as a, as a spinner in the team. 
if I had a phone, I don't think I had money to buy data to access the YouTube stuff. So literally, I, it was just self-taught everything. Uh, Jim Maxwell in, in Sydney, uh, and so it's, it's nice to be talking to you. So there's obviously a fair bit of background to all of this. Can we go back and start where it all started for you in being absorbed in this wonderful game of cricket? How did it happen? So what happened was, so growing up, I used to love sports. I started going to cricket. There's a guy that I, that we used to live with uh, back in Zimbabwe as well. I'll give him more credit. He is the one who started from scratch with me, like catching the ball, throwing the ball. But we were using uh, lemons because we didn't have the balls to use. Uh, so he would great sitting. substitute. <laughs> yeah. So he would be sitting on the veranda with his clashes or with his clashes because he, he he couldn't walk since he's he's uh, disabled. Uh, so he would show me what to do, uh, how to do things, and I could understand him. So mentally, he's the one who actually gave me the confidence that if you take this seriously, you can go far. And that time I was like fourteen years old. And then from that time, I fell in love with cricket. And they said that's fascinating about your background in Zimbabwe, but how did you come to be in Australia? Glenelg, here in Australia, they agreed to, to take me as well. But this time they were willing to pay my uh, visa, my flights and everything. So that was a positive. And then the mm. catch was as well, I would play second grade. Uh, there's a day I was selected to play to do the to play the trials, like to play the trial matches in the scopes. Yeah, I didn't do very well. I didn't do bad. Uh, it wasn't great. And then I came home and told my Aussie dad that I felt like I was a chicken in that game. And then he was like, no, don't tell yourself that. And then I said, nah, I felt like I was a chicken. I wasn't great but I'm going to push myself and make sure that I meet the standard and make sure I'll fit into the team. And then a few months, I worked hard on my bowling and um, I started feeling like I was fitting in well. And then I started being selected to, I mean, invited to train with the big bash girls, girls as well. Yeah. That feeling came back again that, oh my God, I feel like I'm a chicken again. And then I worked <laughs> hard on my bowling again. <laughs> <laughs> again and then I remember the second season I was invited I felt like I feel like I can make it into this team Anesu this is Charu Sharma from Bangalore India what a remarkable story congratulations on everything that you've done uh, I, I, I have Thank to you. ask you though being being the first world cricketer in the WBBL from Zimbabwe is the Zimbabwean cricket board sharing anything with you in terms of your progress are they a partner here with you or are you just entirely on your own? I yesterday actually spoke to the head of cricket, um, Give Mo Makoni. It was me actually thanking him how much support he gave me to to come here. Um, because at first he's the one who allowed me, like who helped me process the paperwork for me to be allowed to play here. So yeah, I'm still in contact with them. Um, and yeah, they always wish me well. Yeah, we are still in contact. Well, you're a real and pioneer and among many things that you've done, and I hope many follow you from Zimbabwe and around the world. But I have to quickly ask you, uh, with some success now, winner of the WBBL with the Strikers, what does the future hold for you? Are you obviously going to be much more involved with cricket or are you already thinking about things? Oh, at the moment, my cricketing career, it feels like it's just starting. Um, <laughs> yeah, I feel like it all with it, but it's funny how it's just starting. Yeah, the other side of cricket, I'll have to think about it later, but at the moment, it's just um, taking it as it comes in this cricket journey. Well, Anessu, thank you so much for sharing your story with us because it is, it is a remarkable one and we will watch you with interest as you continue your cricket career, as you said, right at the very start. So congratulations on winning at the WBBL. Yes, thank you.
Anesu Mashangwe, Zimbabwean leg spinner. What an extraordinary story that is. Well, next on Stump, something of a row has broken out in Australia amongst uh, former Australian teammates, specifically former bowler Mitchell Johnson, questioning whether his old teammate David Warner should be given what he has called a hero send-off in the Test Series against Pakistan. Now, Warner, who's a veteran of 109 tests, has said that he wants to retire from the format on his home ground, the SCG, this January. The 37-year-old rescued a poor run of form last January with a double hundred in his 100th test match when questions had been swirling around about his form and his place in the side. Now, he hasn't had the greatest run since. Uh, Remember, Warner was given a 12-month ban from cricket for his part in Sandpaper Gate, the ball-tampering scandal that rocked Australia's 2018 tour of South Africa. Now, let me recap for you what Mitchell Johnson has said. He was writing in his weekly column in the West Australian newspaper... He said, as we prepare for David Warner's farewell series, can somebody please tell me why? Why a struggling test opener gets to nominate his own retirement date? And why a player at the centre of one of the biggest scandals in Australian cricket history warrants a hero's send-off? It's been five years, he goes on, and David Warner has still never really owned the ball tampering scandal. Now, there was much more, Jim, wasn't there, that was that was written uh, in the column as well. Uh, Warner is in the Australian squad for the first test in Perth next week, and it does seem highly likely that he will feature in a farewell test in Sydney. Um, first of all, on Mitchell Johnson's comments... What have you made for them? Were they warranted? How did you take them? I think it was too personal, far too personal. Um, we saw when Justin Langer was relieved of his coaching job, Mitchell Johnson fired up in support of his West Australian mate. And I think there have been times, unfortunately, where Mitchell Johnson, during the course of his career as a player and, and now as someone that looks back on the game, has... Um, Lack judgment, maybe emotional immaturity is part of it. Certainly there's a lot of passion, and I respect massively what Mitch normally has to say, but I'll miss, I think he's off the ball. David Warner has not been pressured by anyone in the last six months to lose his place in the team, and it's ludicrous to suggest that anyone else could take his place on merit at the moment When you look at his record, he will go down in history as one of the greatest players Australia's ever had. And across three formats of the game, he scored 18,000 runs for his country, 25 test centuries. So, Mitch, I think you've got that wrong. If you've got a gripe, pick up the phone and speak to him. Well, it certainly felt that in the, you know, a week out from the test series starting, there was precious little else for newspapers to be getting stuck into. So, you know, opportune time to, to jump all over and almost sort of creating something you know, to, to keep keep the headlines going. And, of course, players are, you know, have been more than willing to, to come to the defence of Warner and it keeps fueling the fire at the moment in the absence of, you know, on-field rivalries between the teams that often would be, you know, the focus of, uh, of this sort of build-up. I mean, Cherry, one place where Warner is not a polarising force seems to be India, where, you know, he, he has a hugely popular following, doesn't he? Has, has this kind of spat made the headlines in India in any way? Well, strangely enough, they have. Yes, there's been a fair amount of mention because it's all of the social media. And I think a lot of the regular media takes most of their material, masala, from the social media. So there's been a lot of uh, recounting of what's happened between Mitch and and Dave Warner. And of course, Warner uh, still uh, playing in India and a force in the IPL, though not as much as the past, uh, has also once again earned a few more fans because he sent a a social media message to all those in Chennai. They've gone through a major flood the last couple of days. And Warner's comment was very much on top, saying, I really feel for my mates in Chennai and so on and so forth. So, uh, yeah, I think his equity in India has not lessened at all. While Mitch Johnson is, well, to the cricketing public in India, perhaps faded away a bit. But Warner's still very much there. So I have to confess that he still has a lot of sympathy here. And maybe, Jim, as you said, maybe Mitch Johnson just been told by the editorial side, hey, listen, rake something up here (laughs) because nobody's paying attention to the Australia-Pakistan series. I'm just kidding. Well, Mitch has spoken about it, hasn't it, on on his own podcast that he has uh, with uh, Bharat Sundarason, who interviews him. And he's he's been quite, well, certainly, you know, forthright about sort of backing the piece and what he wrote. And, you know, when you're asked to write a column, if you have an honestly held opinion, it is your right to express that. Then you can't help reading it through the prism of feeling. I think, Jim, like you said, that it came from a very, quite a personal place. 
Um, and I think there was one line which he has said he regrets putting in or that he would have perhaps taken out with hindsight, which was having a bit of a jibe about people waving pieces of sandpaper uh, at Warner, perhaps at, um, at Sydney. When you look at Warner and his, uh, his legacy, if you like, then, Jim, to what extent is Sandpapergate going to stay with him? It's going to stay with him. It's going to stay with Australia. Um, that accusation about being cheats and sandpaper, it's going to hang around for a long, long time. And whether or not David Warner tips a bit of petrol on it with a, the revelations in a book uh, remains to be seen. But uh, he probably needs to tread a bit carefully once he does stop playing for Australia uh, to make sure that um, his reputation is a bit stronger than it has been for a lot of his career. But when you look, as I've said, at his numbers, you can't deny that he has been one of our greatest players. And the way he even came into the game was quite extraordinary, wasn't it? Because he hadn't played a, a first-class match uh, before he was stepping out and, and performing all sorts of extraordinary feats. And he brought that T20 game into the test arena, really, sort of one of the, the first to take that kind of bludgeoning approach, if you like. Do you think that it's time with you know, Australian former cricketers and the current cricketers to refrain from this kind of public war of words, which, you know, on more than one occasion they've been drawn into, I think, particularly over the, the Justin Langer saga. But is there, you know, a better way of um, having disagreements, if you like, or at least just not airing these comments across quotes that fly across the media? Oh, it's ever thus. I mean, some of the most successful teams in history have had arguments um, when they haven't been bonded on the field and creating superb performances. It's one of uh, the highlights to me, and uh, I can I can see it looming as we move towards the back end of Pat Cummins' career. He'll go down as one of the greatest leaders we've ever had. And it's because of what really has happened in terms of the results this year. I mean, this is a man who's grown into a job that no one thought, as a fast bowler, he could manage. He's managing it damn well so far, and I just hope it continues. So at the moment, Australia's in a very healthy position Right, well, that is all we've got time for on this week's Stump. So I'll say thanks to Jim Maxwell and Charis Sharma and, of course, to all of you. And we'll see you again next week. Bye for now.